Okay, well, we got off to a weird start that time, but uh, this is going to be a relatively good show. I've got so much stuff. I brought a whole bunch of my books. I got a new book right here. This is probably going to be one of the better ones. This is Kevin Ryan, who's the one who got fired from NIST for telling the truth. Uh, this time he's, uh, it's called Another 19, where he actually names names of who he thinks is responsible. Um, we're going to get right into a video right here. Over the last few days, uh, I knew that we'd have a lot of recapping to do after the 9-11 anniversary. Um, Russia Today came out and officially, as, a, as an organization, I think they're the first actual news organization to do it, uh, declared 9-11 was an inside job. So we're going to play the video and show you uh, exactly what they have to say about that. It's a, this is a great one. Daniel Bush, your top officials say the White House is behind the terrorism of their population and new evidence from 9-11. Coming up. Whistleblowers leak U.S. talks with the head of Al-Qaeda. World Trade 7 is shown on Times Square. And the father of a Twin Towers victim tells us about being attacked by mainstream media. Decades of terror against their own population blamed on extremists has actually been funded and planned by the White House. Top-level officials in the government and the CIA confirmed campaign known as Gladio is called by former CIA head Bill Colby a, quote, major operation. In sworn testimony, one of the conspirators confessed, you have to attack civilians, the people, women, children, far removed from any political game, so authorities can bring in a state of emergency. Dr. Daniel Ganser, author of NATO's Secret Armies, thanks very much indeed for coming on. So mainstream media don't report this, but it is now on the record and officially documented that decades of terror attacks against their own population are in fact organized by the CIA and the White House. Operation Northwoods with evidence for, of Operation Gladio. We have the data now available. And then the people understand that this exists, um, but they still have a, a psychological moment w w where they have a hard time to believe that it still goes on because it's, it's, it's bad news, you know? It basically means that terrorism can be manipulated in order to um, in order to move people around like like sheep, really, and and if you're told you're sheep and you're being moved by by false flag terrorism, I mean this is really something you don't want to hear. Yeah, we keep finding this term strategy of tension by the White House. What does it mean? Strategy of tension uh, actually means that you blow up a bomb and say uh, your enemy did it. What we do have is um, evidence that this strategy of tension goes on. It does, it's not over. Bigger than Watergate, the FBI's Dennis Sacker calls US shielding Al-Qaeda leaders up to 2001 and reports veterans today still ongoing. FBI whistleblower Sybil Edmonds has exposed the, quote, innumerable regular meetings between US representatives and bin Laden's deputy, now head of al-Qaeda, Ayman al-Zawahiri, leading up to September 2001. July 2001, FBI agents closing in on the 9-11 plotters were thrown off the case and threatened with prosecution. Then, when officers arrested Mohammed Khalifa, directly linked to America's most wanted terrorist, Ramzi Youssef, the Secretary of State himself intervened, had Khalifa immediately deported to Saudi and released. People at the CIA were rich, not even speaking in retrospect, but contemporaneous with what the intelligence community knew. Khalifa's deportation was unreal. Dr. Kevin Barrett is the author of Questioning the War on Terror. Great to speak to you. We actually have leaders admitting these terrorists are just tools. And that's what Al-Qaeda is. It's a cat's paw for Western intelligence agencies. And we heard this from the Arab world's leading political commentator, Mohammed Haikal, who told us immediately after 9-11 that this official story of 9-11 is ridiculous. He said when he was at the highest levels of government in Europe, he was the one who was in charge of essentially uh, infiltrating and virtually running so-called al-Qaeda. He said al-Qaeda is full of uh, people from Saudi intelligence, from uh, U.S. intelligence, Israeli intelligence, and of course Egyptian intelligence. Uh, it couldn't do anything on its own. British scholar Nafis Ahmad, who's one of the world's leading scholars of terrorism, and one of the best, uh, talks about an incident that happened in Turkey 
I believe this was a little bit before 9-11, a high level, a supposed senior Al-Qaeda commander was arrested in Turkey. And the guards at the prison who were devout Muslims noticed that he wasn't praying. Uh, he was asking for pork. Uh, and they said, what, you know, I thought we thought you were a radical Muslim. And uh, he kind of laughed and, and said, uh, no, no, this is all just a, a strategy of tension. This 9-11, the world's top physicists, pilots, engineers joined victims' families to sidestep the mainstream media wall of silence. Huge billboards on Times Square and across the states confront the fact most Americans don't know a third giant tower on 9-11 wasn't even hit by a plane, yet somehow collapsed in free fall. At 5.20 p.m., World Trade 7 suddenly, neatly and symmetrically just folded like a pancake. This is high school physics. A building cannot do free fall with 40,000 tons of structural steel in its structural system without it being blown up. The government version is that office fires made all 84 steel columns break at the same time. But there are other versions. John Cole's among thousands of leading independent experts with architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Great to speak to you. So who did it? Who didn't do it? is the, the 19 hijackers that allegedly flew the plane. It is impossible. It is impossible to melt that steel by the office fires, the jet fuel, or the collapse itself. It's a physical impossibility. It cannot be replicated experimentally. It defies the laws of physics. If you set aside your politics, you set aside your beliefs and your religion, and you use the scientific method. World Trade Center 7 is basically a classic controlled demolition that where a building free falls and comes straight down into virtually its own uh, footprint. Uh, the only explanation that explains all the evidence, the nanothermite, the, uh, the iron microspheres, the high temperatures found out there, the free fall, the uniform, what I call the uniform acceleration of the towers, when those came down, there was no impact or jolt when it hit the undamaged section below. Because there was no jolt, something blew those towers out, allowing it to, to uniformly uh, accelerate downward. The only thing that makes any sense at all from a scientific uh, perspective is that those towers were blown up. John made a mockery of mainstream sites, Nat Geo and Pop Mechanics, who've desperately tried, for instance, to show 175 pounds of military nanothermite couldn't break the columns. John did it with just one pound. Can thermite of any type burn through steel beams? I guess it can. Renowned librarian and researcher Elizabeth Woodworth has come in to help form the consensus 9-11 panel, confirming it uses best practice with the most rigorous peer review. Thanks so much for joining us. There's this remarkably high consensus among experts that the government version can't be right. We have some of the top experts in the field who've published in uh, peer-reviewed scientific journals. And yet, these scientific journals exist, like the Herrick study, but they're never covered in the media. If people knew about the research, uh, they would find it compelling. Dr. Griffin has said that he d he's never heard of anybody who saw the evidence became converted to this point of view and then changed back. Yeah, the panel's made government already change its story and admit Skyscraper 7's freefall. That's right. Uh, David Chandler uh, is an extraordinary uh, model maker. Chandler is on the panel and he devised a model to prove that the top floors uh, fell with no resistance. There's only one way that that can happen and that is that all the, the, the columns, there are 84 of these columns, that they were severed at the same moment. Dr. Graham McQueen accessed the New York Fire Department records from that day. Thanks very much for joining us. Never broadcast by mainstream media, but more than 100 witnesses have even reported the explosives bringing down the Twin Towers. Here was this roughly 10,000 pages of extremely rich eyewitness material. And I found that there were 118 people who clearly perceived explosions, you know. We have firefighters who are used to fighting high-rise fires, who are used to encountering, encountering smoke explosions and boilers, and yet they use words like bombs. You know, they don't identify with the things we would expect. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if they had detonated. Yeah, you know, as detonated. As if they were planned yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down. Bob McIlvain has wanted answers why the post-mortem of his son Bobby found his fatal injuries in the South Tower consistent 
not with fireballs, but explosives. Yet mainstream host Rachel Maddow here recently sneered. He's not only a conspiracy theorist for asking questions, but also attempted to connect him to violence and Al-Qaeda. All of these nefarious conspiracies about government plots to kill and conspire and lie about it and cover up the real truth. I mean, this stuff is as ridiculous as it has ever been, but it is as ridiculous as it is dangerous. Bobby's father joins us. Thank you very much for speaking with us. How do you feel first losing your son and now being portrayed as the bad guy? My son died. He, he was died from an explosion. I can prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. If I was in a courtroom, a, a jury cannot not accept that as proof. So that's where we have our problem. And I say, well, this is an inside job. Well, my son died from an inside job from someone putting bombs detonations. I would make her sit in this room and go through what I just went with you. And then I would say, now you tell me I'm a conspiracy theorist. Just shows you how awful our media is. I don't want to call her a the media she makes over a million dollars and they tell her what to say. One uh, newspaper reporter and is from the Philadelphia area was very upfront with me. She said, you know, Bob, she says, as a reporter, I am the problem because we will lose our jobs. If I take that, just that little bit you just said, to the editor, he will crush it. So I'm, I'm telling you right now, I can't put your story out there. The media owners will not allow them. The press would not cover just that because it will put a little doubt in people's minds. Yeah, who do you blame for all this? The people of the United States are just as much to blame because they just want to believe that we are good people. We are an exceptional country. But this is what governments do. You know, it's very Machiavellian. Now we have an endless war on terror. I know what these people in Iraq, I know what these people in Syria, I know what these people in Libya, Afghanistan are going through because they're all losing children. And that's what it's all about. Everybody's losing family members. And it's pure hell. So that's it, Daniel. <laughs> Tomorrow, Congress votes to bomb Syria, the latest war of the post 9-11 era. The U.S. would now officially be Al-Qaeda's air force, notes former Congressman Kucinich. But America's had enough. Nine in ten oppose this invasion, the most unpopular in history. Regarding 9-11, a massive 84% now say the government's lying. We now have the precedents documented that government's prepared to commit supreme crimes against its population. Exactly what happened on 9-11 can be argued by both so-called conspiracy theorists and the authorities. What's beyond dispute is on the 11th of September, the world will join to mourn the almost 3,000 innocent people who lost their lives. This is The Truth Seeker. Yeah, I like that. Mox News, unfair and biased. Well, that's, that's a real good balance for Fox News, um, or Faux News, F-A-U-X, as it's actually spelled. Um, well, I'm, we're going to do a little thing, a little different h here right now. Uh, if you uh, take a look at the, go ahead and put my computer up in front of me, uh, so you don't need to see me. I want now. What I've got here, oh, it's blinking. But anyway, what I've got here is the uh, analytics from YouTube for my channel. Now, I, I don't have hardly any views according to uh, the standards of Alex Jones, of course. But uh, I was just looking at this map as you slide the mouse over it. Oh, it's blinking. Now we got a bad converter here. But as I slide my mouse over these, like here, South Africa, 109. Everywhere I, everywhere I slide the mouse, there's a viewer. Like there's Saudi Arabia, there's almost 300 in Saudi Arabia. In India, 439. In Saudi Arabia, I mean in uh, Australia, 1,800. Um, even up here in Russia, there were 66 views. There were some views b before in China, but they stopped reporting them. That was in my first year. Kazakhstan, four views. You know, I might not have very many viewers, but it's it's just really a cool thing to to see that, you know, my efforts here in Portland, Oregon, are actually viewed all over the country. Hello to Mexico. Almost every single country in South America has seen my videos. Every single one of them. Argentina, Peru, Ecuador, Venezuela, of course Brazil, and Mexico, Canada, 
and then Iceland right here in the middle, 34 views in Iceland. You know, I'm just, I went down here to the Philippines, uh, wherever they are, right? I'm in the right area. There they are. <laughs> uh, 179 views. Then you go a little further, Indonesia. Here's Papua New Guinea, one view. <laughs> you can, can you see my mouse moving? Well, it's blinking too much, but anyway. Uh, We'll, we'll go to another video. Hey, you guys, get that uh, Wesley Clark video ready on, on a playback computer. Um, anyway, it, it, here we go. Let's see. Uh, United Kingdom, 5,000 views. That, they're pretty staunch supporters, I guess. Uh, Ireland, 367 views. United States, 29,000 views. Okay. Anyway, um, go ahead and put me back on, and uh, I'll show you some of these other books, like this book. Doesn't that look like the uh, official 9-11 Commission book? Well, this is the book from the 9-11 Toronto hearings that they just completed in, well, actually, they did them in 2011 and uh, finished it up in 2012 with uh, this book. and. It, there's a five-hour uh, DVD that you can watch, too. We've shown many parts of that already on this uh, program. Now, this is a good book, and I accidentally got two of them. Um, I bought two of them. The, the Big Bamboozle, Philip Marshall, uh, he wrote that just before he was assassinated. Well, they say he died, but, you know, we pretty much know he was silenced. And uh, I figured while I was at it, I'd show you some of these mainstay books. Here's Webster Tarpon, or Webster Griffin Tarpley. I just call him Webster Tarpley, and it's Synthetic Terror, 9-11, Synthetic Terror. That's a, a good one. But I just got Extreme Prejudice, Susan Lindauer. She was the CIA asset. And she had so much good information that we, we showed about, well, P PDX 9-11 Truth recorded about an hour and a half or almost two hours of, of uh, her presentation and question and answers, and we've played parts of that. But this book puts it all right in front of you. It's just killer. Now, the other book that matches that, while we're talking about women uh, whistleblower types, of course, you know Sibel Edmonds, the uh, most classified woman She's the one who uh, tried to go through channels with, she worked for the FBI as a translator and she tried to go through channels and whistleblow. Uh, she testified that uh, bin Laden was on the payroll before, during, and after 9-11. So, you know, pretty important information that our country is denying. Um, then, how about the death of bin Laden? This is a book by uh, David Ray Griffin, who is probably the most prolific 9-11 writer of them all, and uh, he supports this, the idea that bin Laden was actually, uh, he died of natural causes from his uh, kidney dialysis problem uh, in 2001. Then, this is a new book out, well, relatively new, uh, Mark Gaffney, Black 9-11. He follows the money, and he follows the uh, it, the behind the scenes plots that we don't really hear much about. Back to David Ray Griffin. This is a real important book, Cognitive Infiltration. It was written in response to Obama appointing Cass Sunstein as what information czar, if you recall that. Well, Cognitive Infiltration is the name of a paper that thoroughly discredits, any, you know, any decent intentions that uh, Cass Sunstein may have had. He's, uh, he's the one probably behind most of the trolls that are out there on the, on the internet trying to tell 9-11 twoofers how bad we are. Uh, you know, paid shills out there trying to disrupt. Remember during uh, COINTELPRO, the uh, CIA employed 3,000 agents to do nothing but, you know, eight hours a day of infiltrate, uh, obfuscate, disrupt, and misdirect uh, 
everything they could in the in the so-called uh, alternative media or protest movement. So, and of course, I've already covered Kevin Ryan. Now, what we've got here is this is one of the most important books in the 9/11 movement. You can see how thick it is. It's it's one of the best documented, best uh, researched books you'll ever see. Michael Rupert, he's the one who, he's the ex-LA uh, vice officer who busted the CIA for drug running. You know, he's the one who exposed that they were co importing cocaine and uh, he got in a lot of trouble for that. He was one of those whistleblowers, kind of like Snowden. But Crossing the Rubicon, this book explains an awful lot, especially about the uh, drills that were going on the day of 9-11, the, uh, the fact that they were substantially like the actual hijack scenario that uh, is now the official story, um, putting multiple false blips on the radar. Well, anyway, uh, we kind of covered a lot of that. I've got more stuff to talk about, but let's let's take a look at Wesley Clark. He, what he's doing here is, uh, this is 2000, well, I, th I think this is 2007, but he's recounting an incident in 2002 where uh, the, what, the Joint Chiefs of Staff informed him that the plan was to go after seven countries in a row. Now, this is without any of the BS about, you know, trying to assign blame, you know, this, we're doing this because of 9-11, we're doing this because it's the only moral thing to do, we're doing this, you know. No, this is the Pentagon planning and it's just that we're going to invade seven countries in five years and we're going to uh, completely destroy their governments. So anyway, let's listen to General Wesley Clark tell it like it is and then I'll be back, right back. For a TV. The world is thinking. What happened in 9-11 is we didn't have a strategy, we didn't have bipartisan agreement, we didn't have American understanding of it, and we had instead a policy coup in this country. A coup. A policy coup. Some hard-nosed people took over the direction of American policy, and they never bothered to inform the rest of us. I went through the Pentagon 10 days after 9-11. I couldn't stay away from Mother Army. I went back there to see Don Rumsfeld. I'd worked for him as a White House fellow in the 1970s. All this is in the book. And, um, and I said, am I doing okay on CNN? He said, yeah, 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 fine. He said, uh, I'm thinking about it. He says, I read your book. And uh, he said, uh, this is a book that talks about the Kosovo campaign. And he said, I just want to tell you, he said, nobody's going to tell us where or when we can bomb. Nobody. He said, I'm thinking of calling this a floating coalition. What do you think about that? I said, well, sir, uh, thanks for reading my book. And, uh, well, uh, he said, thanks. That's all the time I've got. <laughs> really? And um, I went downstairs. I was leaving the Pentagon, and an officer from the Joint Staff called me into his office and said, I, I want you to know, he said, sir, we're going to attack Iraq. And I said, why? He said, we don't know. He said, uh, I said, well, did they tie Saddam to 9-11? He said, uh, no. He said, but um, I guess it's, they don't know what to do about terrorism. And so uh, the, it, they think, but they can attack states and they want to look strong. And so I guess they think if they take down a state, it will intimidate the terrorists. And, you know, it's like that old saying he said, if the only tool you have is a hammer, then every problem has to be a nail. Well, I walked out of there pretty upset, and then um, we attacked Afghanistan. I was pretty happy about that. We should have. And then I came back to the Pentagon about six weeks later. I saw the same officer. I said, why, uh, why haven't we attacked Iraq? We still going to attack Iraq? He said, oh, sir. He says, it's worse than that. He said, um, he pulled up a piece of paper off his desk. He said, I just got this memo from the Secretary of Defense's office that says we're going to attack and destroy the governments in, in seven countries in five years. We're going to start with Iraq, and then we're going to move to Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Iran. I said, seven, seven countries in five years. I said, is that a classified memo? He said, yes, sir. I said, well, don't show it to me. He was about to show it to me. He said, because I want to talk about it. And 
I, I, I sat on this information I, for a long time, for about six or eight months. I, I was so stunned by this, I couldn't begin to talk about it. And I couldn't believe it would really be true, but that's actually what happened. Uh, these people took control of the policy in the United States. And I realized then, it came back to me, a 1991 meeting I had with Paul Wolfowitz. You know, in 2001, he was Deputy Secretary of Defense, but in 1991, he was the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. It's the number three position in the Pentagon. And I had gone to see him when I was a one-star general. I was commanding the National Training Center. I had met him one time. He said, if you ever get to Washington, come look me up. They always say that. Well, I was there in Washington. It was a Friday afternoon. I'd visited Colin Powell. He'd given me five minutes of his precious time and sent me on my way, and I was bored in the Pentagon. And, and I thought, I'll just go. Who can I see? I'll, I think I'll see Wolfowitz. So I called, and up there he was available. Scooter Libby came to the door. I met Scooter for the first time, and he brought me in. And uh, I said to Paul, I said, and this is 1991, I said, Mr. Secretary, you must be pretty happy with the performance of the troops in, in Desert Storm. And he said, uh, well, yeah, he said, but, but not really, he said, because the truth is we should have gotten rid of Saddam Hussein, and we didn't. And this was just after the Shia uprising in, in March of 91, which we had provoked, and then we kept our troops on the sidelines and didn't intervene. And he said, but one thing we did learn, he said, we learned that we can use our military in the region, in the Middle East, and the Soviets won't stop us. He said, and we've got about five or ten years to clean up those old Soviet client regimes, Syria, Iran, Iraq, before the next great superpower comes on to challenge us. And it was like, you know, I'm coming out of the Mojave Desert. I've been training troops. I haven't been thinking geostrategy for some time. And suddenly, a guy just sort of shoves this nugget at you. Well, you remember it. It was a pretty stunning thing. You mean... The purpose of the military is to, to, to start wars and change governments. It's not to sort of deter conflict. We're going to invade countries. And, I, I, you know, my mind was spinning. And uh, I put that aside. It was like a nugget that you hold on to. This country was taken over by a group of people with a policy coup. Wolfowitz and Cheney and Rumsfeld and... You could name a half dozen other collaborators from the Project for a New American Century. They wanted us to destabilize the Middle East, turn it upside down, make it under our control. It went back to those comments in 1991. Now, did anybody ever tell you that? Was there a national dialogue on this? Did senators and congressmen stand up and denounce this plan? Was there a full-fledged American debate on it? Absolutely not. And there still isn't. And that's why we're failing in Iraq. Because Iran and Syria know about the plan. All you have to do is read the, the, the weekly standard and, and listen to Bill Crystal, and he blabbermouths it all over the world. Richard Pearl the same way. They could hardly wait to finish Iraq so they could move into Syria. It was like a laydown. Oh, our legions are going to go in there. This wasn't what the American people voted George Bush into office. Well, they didn't actually vote him into office, but it wasn't what many of the people who... It wasn't what he campaigned on. He campaigned on a humble foreign policy, the most arrogant foreign policy in American history. He campaigned on no peacekeeping no nation building, and here he is with Afghanistan and Iraq. It's astonishing. So the root of the problem is not how many troops are in Iraq. Please believe me. Don't be mad, if you're a Democrat, at your Democratic congressman because they can't reduce the troops and frustrate the president. That's not the issue. And if you're a Republican, don't be mad at the Democrats because they're fussing with the troops. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, if you're an American, you ought to be concerned about the strategy of the United States in this region. What is our aim? What is our purpose? Why are we there? Why are Americans dying in this region? That is the issue. Okay, it only took Americans and the rest of the world another...
what, four, no, uh, you got to do the math right, I guess, uh, yeah, four more years, and uh, finally, you know, they tried to do the weapons of mass destruction, you know, hold up the little vial of cocaine and say it's anthrax, uh, well, everybody's hip to that now, so when they hold up the vial of cocaine and say that it's sarin gas and it's put out by the Syrian government, we know they're lying. And by the way, the uh, U.S. military intelligence, just le a document was just leaked that uh, actually stated that it was the rebels who did the gassing and not Assad himself. And so, you know, what? and we said that a long time ago, and of course, two or three years ago when there was the gas attack, the uh, U United Nations, uh, UNESCO or whatever it was, uh, whoever was doing the, the investigation nailed the rebels back then and one more time. So this is the third time in a row that the rebels have done the gas and you know I, I'm just amazed to watch Kerry get up there and just lie through his teeth. I mean just outright lie. There's no even no no pretense at telling the truth. He just oh and then by the way, you ought to look up Christine Amanapur, Amanapur you know, the CNN anchor. Uh, she was out there talking about, it's a moral imperative that we must attack Syria. It, you, you can't weigh the beheading of Christians against, you know, it, it's not a moral equivalent. The gas is just so terrible. We've got to go and saturation bomb the entire country just like we did in Iraq, yeah. I'm sorry, but uh, war is not the way. It just isn't. Um, by the way, I, this is from a show I did recently. I thought you might like to see it. Slavery is the legal fiction that a person is property. Corporate personhood is the legal fiction that property is a person. Okay, so just thought I'd put that out. Now we've got a little five minute quickie video here. It's uh, it's meant to be humorous, but it just jams in the facts. So you might this might be something good to show somebody who doesn't have the time to look into 9/11, but something in this video will catch his eye. So let's just let her rip. You guys ready? Okay. On a time, there was a plan to build a phallic symbol in Manhattan to show the might of the USA. The world's leading architects and engineers worked to satisfy this demand. The result was not just the highest building in the world, but two. So that point was nailed home. In line with Superman leaping tall buildings aims, they had to be capable of being struck by airline jets and also be impossible to bring down by nefarious villains. Careful checks were made to make sure that the steel would withstand severe fires as people didn't like the idea of working a quarter mile up in the sky if they couldn't get out in an emergency. The engineers proudly proclaimed that the steel would withstand a three hour severe fire and the building could be struck by multiple impacts of jet liners. As it would just be like mosquito netting on your screen door, this intense grid, and the jet plane is just a pencil puncturing that screen netting. It would laugh at hurricane winds and snicker at attempts to bomb it. Time passed until it was noticed by the owners that they were having difficulty in finding tenants to fully occupy the massive spaces they had constructed. Rumblings about having deadly asbestos throughout them didn't help. Offload was the cry before we are lumbered with massive costs. Along comes a knight in white armor. In the shape of Lucky Larry who bought the lease in June of 01. Hooray, cried the masses. Larry to the rescue. He rapidly ensures the entire World Trade Center complex against terrorist attack and smiles contentedly. He is well named as Lucky because within a few months, 19 Arabs, led by a man on dialysis using a laptop in a cave in Afghanistan, managed to circumvent the might of the entire USA defense system and arrange for jets to go wildly off course, strike two of the phallic symbols of USA power in Manhattan and bring down three buildings there. What the fuck, cried the stunned government. How can this be? We couldn't envisage people flying planes into buildings deliberately at least only three times in the last few years. And anyways, the plans were made. We're only pretend. It isn't our fault. Didn't you see that we were already practicing drills to counter such identical events that day and that's why all our defenses were confused? Wait a minute. Did I just say that we couldn't envisage people flying planes into the building? Well, what I meant was, um, er... Anyway, it was Bin Laden who did it. Anyone can see that. And the guy in downtown Manhattan wearing a hearty shirt could see what happened straight away and told you. I saw this plane come out of nowhere and just ream right into the side of the Twin Tower, exploding through the other side. 
And then I witnessed both towers collapse, one first and then the second, mostly due to structural failure because the fire was just too intense. And we know that steel frame buildings have never fallen down like this before. But fear not, we will ask the world's leading experts, NIST, to explain what happened. Time passes and the world falls into three kinds of people. One, who understands science and physics, who can see that what they have been told is contrary to all the laws of physics. One, who understands science and physics, but finds it impossible to overcome their disbelief that they would be lied to by their government and are capable of ignoring what they see. Then there are those who watch the ball game on TV. The points at issue are fairly basic. The first group asks why gravity works sideways that day. Massive six-ton steel sections were observed and measured to reach 60 miles an hour within the first yard of movement and fly sideways for 300 feet to embed in adjacent buildings. Surely any rational person could expect gravity to work downward. People from group two accept that if the government say it, it can do that then, yes, gravity can work sideways. People from group three are busy looking at the TV schedule for the next ball game. Group one asks why the top part of one building began to tilt slowly to one side, but when it reached 22 degrees list, it disobeys the laws of angular momentum and turned to dust. Group two say that if the government says that's possible, then why should they be questioned? Group three is looking for their fourth beer. Along comes another hero. Up gallops Basant. On September 13th, he released a comprehensive report explaining why these buildings became the first two in history to fall this way. He didn't need to investigate or do any forensic tests. He just knew. Group 1 checked his math and found schoolboy errors. Group 2 checked his math and gave him an A+. Group 3 asked, uh, what does the word maths mean? Bazant imagined the entire floor of the building to disappear when making his first and crucial calculation. The resulting impact speed of the upper block of the tower of 19 miles an hour was then used to proceed to compound that error. Group 1 stared in disbelief at the magnitude of these errors. Group 2 nodded wisely and said, good work, Bazant. Group 3 was looking for the TV remote hidden under 10 beer cans. Meanwhile, back at NIST, they have been told to ensure that all costs that the report must end at the initiation of collapse, and under no circumstances must they try to explain how all the laws of physics were broken that day by looking at total collapse. That was tricky, until out of the blue, they got a report from underwriters' laboratories who had recessed a duplicate of floor truss. After firing a shotgun at the fireproofing, they put it in a furnace, loaded it with double load, heated it to double the temperature, and for double the time. Eureka! They sagged 47 inches, enough to pull the outer walls inward and the upper block would fall, just as Bazant had calculated. Go to press! Group 1 said, hang on. A manager at underwriters' laboratories, Kevin Ryan, had been arguing that these tests had shown 4 inches, but was being ignored. He was concerned that Nest was working on false data, so went directly there to inform them. Two things happened. He was fired by underwriters' laboratories. <laughs> and NIST ignored his information as they needed 47 inches to make their story work. Group 2 said, Kevin Ryan was being disloyal. How dare he undermine his company's integrity? He probably wears brown shoes with a black suit. He can't be trusted. And anyway, the government has told us 47 inches. So what's the problem? Group 3 were asleep and missed the last quarter of the game. And so it goes. Questions about squibs, questions about total energy calculations and kinetic equations, dust tests positive for energetic thermetic material, billions of iron-rich microspheres in all the dust in Manhattan that indicate molten metal. Group 1 stacked up the evidence. Group 2 refused to apply scientific method to examine that the evidence and prefer their belief-based system. Group 3 worried that they have lost their freedoms and that their constitution is being ignored and wonder why. The end. Once upon a okay, time, the there's... end. I was just reading my uh, latest copy of InfoWars magazine. This is the first one of their second year. September was their first issue last year. And uh, there's lots of good stuff in here. This is a particularly good I I issue. Uh, I wa wanted to read something here from you, uh, from this to you. Uh, I'll pick it out during the next video, but basically uh, you heard just in that last video about uh, Kevin Ryan getting fired from NIST because he uh, <laughs> stood up for what actually happened. Well, uh, here's another video about NIST. I think you'll enjoy this one. Just hit, hit that space bar. And On August 21, 2002, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, commenced their investigation. The final report was released on October 26, 2005, producing over 10,000 pages. It's funny they would name it the report on the collapse of the Twin Towers, because the report does not explain how the Twin Towers actually collapsed, claiming that it does not actually include the structural behavior of the tower after initiation was reached and collapse became inevitable. What is important is what got the building to the point of collapse initiation. A major focus of our effort has been on trying to understand the entire process from the minute the airplane hit all the way through the fires and all the way through up to the point of collapse initiation. 10,000 pages. 
and not a single one to actually explain how the towers came down the way they did. NIST admitted in April 2007 that they are unable to provide a full explanation of the total collapse. They depend on a professor, a civil engineer professor from Northwestern University, Dr. Zednik Bazant, who did an analysis where he claims a progressive collapse could collapse the building. Their argument in this paper is that this upper block of floors acts as a tamper to push down, so it, it stays fairly intact as a tamper. That makes some sense, right? But uh, wait a minute, uh, how about Newton's third law, which means, which says that if the upper block exerts a force on the lower block of floors, the lower block exerts an equal force, students, on the upper block, equal. If according to the pile driver theory, the top section here, say this is the 96th floor, should interact with the 94th floor and crush the 94th floor, then the 96th floor should be crushed as well. But in the pile driver theory, you imagine that this whole section goes all the way through all 90 floors and each time crushes the next floor. If you take two objects, which you can crush, and squeeze them together, you crush both of them. This is Newton's third law. You cannot have the same object with the same strength and softness crushing this object without getting hurt itself. It's physically impossible. The pile driver theory not only violates Newton's second law, which we'll see in a while, but it also violates Newton's third. What many people don't realize is these buildings are built to handle several times the load above them. And in fact, in the towers, the perimeter columns could handle five times the load above them, and the core columns could handle three times the load above them. So that load above them, as you can see, had no chance to collapse the lower portion of the building, unless, and this is a big if, unless there was an impact with a deceleration. What happens there is the force is amplified, and it's amplified because the deceleration is many times the rate of gravity. What has to happen though, and you heard me use the word deceleration, is that the ob impacting object has to decelerate. And when it decelerates, it loses velocity. Well, the drop of the upper section of the North Tower, or World Trade Center One, has been measured by a large number of people now. There is no deceleration. The fact that there is no deceleration shows that there was no impulsive load or amplified load. Well, there's demolitions uh, done in France which use what we call the Vernage technique, where they take out a couple floors worth of columns with hydraulics. They take the columns out and they let the building, the upper section of the building drop. And when it impacts the lower section, there's a very definitive, observable jolt, deceleration, and velocity loss. And you can see it in the graph. It is not there in the case of the North Tower. When you watch video closely, in the case of World Trade Center One, you'll see that the upper section disintegrates itself. Its lower stories are breaking up before it even impacts the lower section. It appears to be a controlled demolition of its own, of the upper section. So then, what is left? Where's this block, this tamper, that's supposed to wipe out the lower uh, floors? Sorry, it ain't there, you know? Uh, the question that you're talking about is in 10 seconds of uh, time, or approximately anywhere between 9 and 12 seconds, or 15 seconds of time. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel, molten steel running down the channel rails, like you're in a foundry. Like, like, like a volcano. One, we were down, uh, down at the V1 level, and uh, one of the firefighters uh, said, I think you'd be interested in this, and, and they pulled off a big block of concrete, and there was a, like a little river of steel uh, flowing. As well as the molten metal in the debris, 
It was also observed prior to the South Tower's collapse. A lot of people have said, well, it was probably just aluminum from the airplanes, you know, because aluminum melts at a relatively low temperature. It's like 600 centigrade. Basically, what it comes down to is aluminum does not emit radiation very well. And so when you heat it up, it doesn't tend to glow very well. So the material that was flowing out of that building was not molten aluminum unless it was literally probably above its vaporization temperature, then maybe it would be hot enough to glow like that. But it just doesn't glow like that, so it wasn't aluminum. We have a young professor here who came from NIST. He couldn't believe that NIST would say, you know, if you mix organics with aluminum it'll, it, and pour it out, now it'll have an orange glow. He couldn't believe they'd be wrong. But we couldn't get it. So he was working with me for over an hour, mixing, mixing, mixing this <laughs> concoction of molten aluminum with wood, glass, plastic, carpet pieces. Mix, mix, mix. And you know, it doesn't want to mix. The, that is, the organics don't want to mix with the molten aluminum. We just poured it out. He poured it out, actually. Silvery, not orange glow, no orange glow. New York City, 2001. No tall building had ever collapsed primarily due to fire. But that's exactly what investigators believe happened to the 47-story World Trade Center Building 7 on September 11th. The collapse of World Trade Center 7 was primarily due to fires. They have an elaborate theory. It's called thermal expansion. They say these beams expanded uh, and pushed this girder off of its seat during this fire which allowed the 13th floor to fall on the 12th, the 12th and the 10th, et cetera, leaving column 79 unbraced for nine floors and then it just buckles. And then the whole inside of the building caves out. What's wrong with this theory? Well, first of all, the fire was out on this floor according to photographs that NIST provided over an hour before this collapse even happened and yet the, the collapse is blamed on a current fire expanding these beams. Second, these beams don't elongate, they sag as you saw in the Cardington test. Even if that would have happened, it wouldn't have pushed this girder off of its seat because that girder is tied with shear studs to the concrete floor up above. According to NIST, it uh, didn't have shear studs, which the construction documents show clearly that they did. Uh, we couldn't have had that girder falling off of its seat because these beams only expanded uh, three or four inches, not enough to push it off of its seat on this column. But let's say it could have. They claimed that when the girder was pushed past center, when the web, the vertical part, was no longer over the seat, that the flange folded and the girder fell. Well, in the plans, they had flange stiffeners, a piece of metal, welded to the web and to the flange, designed specifically to keep the flange from folding. And they left these flange stiffeners out. There is no chance this was a mistake. This was a deliberate fraud to make their collapse theory work. This is a graph for the roof line of WTC7. Note that for well over two seconds, the graph is linear so the acceleration is constant. The slope of the linear portion of the graph is essentially equal to the acceleration of gravity within the margin of error of the measurements. In other words, for this building, even though it is falling straight down through its own supporting structure, free fall actually happened. Notice also that there's a sharp onset of free fall. The building is holding steady then it simply lets go. A mass in free fall can do no work. And if something was being destroyed, it's not being destroyed by the falling mass. It was destroyed to enable the mass to fall. The fact of free fall is literally proof of demolition. We conducted the study without bias, with no preconceived notions about what happened. When we started the investigation, we considered a whole range of possible hypotheses. And from that, based on our technical judgment, we decided what were credible hypotheses that we should pursue further. We judged that other hypotheses that were suggest, possible hypotheses that were suggested, really didn't, were not credible enough uh, to justify an invest, you know, a careful investigation. 
An investigative reporter, her name is Jennifer Abel, called up the NIST spokesman, her name is Newman. She asked, what about the letter where NIST said it didn't look for evidence of explosives? See, they didn't even look, they admitted that finally in a letter. Newman, who's uh, listed as the spokesperson, right, because there was no evidence of that, huh? Shh, go away. Abel, Jennifer, but how can you know there's no evidence if you don't look for it first? Good girl, that's it. <laughs> you know, investigative reporting, let's find the answer. Newman, if you're looking for something that isn't there, you're wasting your time. <laughs> now, am I missing something here? I mean, this is offensive to my intelligence. So the preconceived notion of NIST is that there's no evidence for explosives, and so there's no point in looking. Uh, that is the most unscientific thing that you can possibly think of, not to look because you don't expect to find evidence. But fortunately, the dust was examined by independent scientists. Did you know that a peer-reviewed study was published in 2009 by a group of scientists revealing that a high-tech explosive called nanothermite was found in all dust samples? My name is Mark Basile, I'm a chemical engineer, and I began experiments with the World Trade Center dust in 2008. I found the red-gray chips referred to in that study. I witnessed low temperature ignition of red-gray chips at 450 degrees C, resulting in molten iron droplets. And I conclude that the red layer in the dust particles is a nanothermitic material. Nanothermite in the dust should be a wake-up call to all of us. It doesn't belong there. And despite all that, we still have uh, these uh, shills out there that want to uh, suggest that these are paint chips. You know, they say a picture speaks a thousand words, and it really does. I mean, you can just see there's one of these things is not like the other. One of these things is not quite the same. Uh, okay. Uh, well, we only have about six minutes. I'm going to my favorite, Abby Martin, again, and, and she's got George Galloway there again, and he's going to be talking about Syria. I'm going to try to j zoom it ahead a little bit. We'll, we'll go ahead and just go out on this. Oh, by the way, here's that uh, InfoWars magazine. Okay, well, let, we'll just go out on this one, and uh, I'll see you in uh, October. That'll be the next show. We're skipping next week and the week after that. So it'll be the first Saturday in October. Anyway, let's go ahead and play this one, if I can get it started. Oh, okay, we'll just wait a second. Okay, here we go. Appear to be ready to endorse it. Behind me is the British Parliament, normally a lapdog, a poodle of American political leaders, but just the other week we revolted and stood up and said this far and no further, no war in Syria. And that too reflected overwhelmingly the popular opinion in the country. But uh, the United States has not been stopped, even by the failure of the British to show up in another shooting war. Uh, yeah, I mean, the hypocrisy is running really strong, George, and I was surprised to see the criminal conspirators from doctoring the Iraq intelligence in the British Parliament vote no. It made me really happy. Uh, a lot of um, proud, proud moments there from the world leaders. Uh, and as we've seen unfold in Iraq post-occupation, there's now a complete civil war rife with sectarian violence. It's a complete disaster. Is it that the decision makers don't understand the religion and the region, or is it that they just don't care? I don't think religion has anything to do uh, with it. Religions uh, believe in the prophets, peace be upon them. Our leaders believe in the prophets and how to get a bigger piece of them. It's about domination, it's about Israel, it's about the projection of American power and the terrifying of potential rivals and competitors. In this case, principally Russia and China. I don't think that they're acting very terrified at this moment. And so the United States is in for a contested war in Syria. And that's why the congressional representatives would be wise to heed the lesson of Iraq. The United States lost thousands of soldiers and tens of thousands of wounded soldiers, maimed many of them forever, 
and many of them committing suicide or murdering people when they got home in the decades since. And many of them, of course, ending up on the streets homeless and jobless. And the congressional representatives ought to beware that what will begin with a flurry of Tomahawk missiles and how obscene is it that the United States calls its killing weapons uh, after the people that it annihilated in order to occupy the country in the first place. It will start with a flurry of Tomahawk cruise missiles, but it will end in a shooting war on the ground and with an occupation and one in a country with 23 religious and ethnic groups within it and in the most combustible possible piece of territory on the earth. The Syrian people will fight them back. Syria's friends will fight them back and they will fight them back everywhere, not just in Syria. You know, I, I say it, it's like we're killing Syrians to show the Syrian regime that killing Syrians is wrong. I just can't wrap my head around it, George, and the stakes are very high as you just and, outlined. Uh, well, well, well put, put, put this one in your mind, Abby. The next time you see President Obama happy clapping in a Christian church, the Al-Qaeda sacked a town called Ma'alula, which I know very well in Syria, where the people are the last people on earth still conducting their Christian services in the language of Jesus, in Aramaic. It is one of the most serene and beautiful and peaceful places on the earth, filled with Christian churches and monasteries and nunneries. And the people there were slaughtered over the last four days, literally slaughtered, with their necks, uh, uh, their throats cut, their heads sawn off. The Christian churches are on fire at the hands of Al-Qaeda. That's Al-Qaeda, paid for and armed by the United States of America. It makes me physically ill to hear that, George, that we're actually bombing the cradle of civilization, the birthplace of humanity. We're not respecting the birthplace of Christianity in, in terms of these leaders who claim that they're Christian. George, we've both been reporting yes, they're that... Never done. they're never done telling us. <laughs> yeah, they're never exactly. done telling us how Christian they are. Exactly. They wear it on their sleeves. <laughs> well... You know, we've both been reporting that a British firm allegedly sold nerve gas to Syria. Let's wrap our minds around this one. Ten months after the Civil War yeah. broke out, also the Digital Journal is reporting that yeah. the Saudi intelligence <laughs> gave the rebels chemical weapons. Why are these insanely contradictory facts not reported on well, in such a serious uh, climate? Well, we're coming to a, a close here, about 18 seconds. Well, we can't, we can't uh, remember, it's official. The British, now, uh, according so to the government, we're all media. terrorists. The fact that I'll Ponte, see you in the October. In May of this year, just a few months ago, at the beginning of the summer, this summer, reported that the Syrian rebels had used the very sarin nerve gas that they're telling us now.